and having him totally down with all these other officers. And they acted as if nothing had happened. You know, uh, were these police officers acting as they were trained? Is this the training they received? That is, you know, that goes, and they are not the 1%. If you know what I mean, it's, it's hard. To, it's hard to know, right? What, what exactly we we mean, right? Because uh-huh. if that is if that is regulation police procedure in Minneapolis, then who okay's that? And is when it you the powers reading, that be, right? Because that's what the the DA there is is deciding, right? They're saying, yeah, there's this video, but we still don't. There's also evidence that suggests that what this this is what the DA is saying. There's evidence that they that the DA has evidence to suggest that what the cop did wasn't illegal <laughs> and the weird thing is that he's arrested now you know if you i don't know if you were too busy setting up the interview but he has just been arrested oh yeah and I charged with heavy with heavy charges uh i think i, I don't know don't quote me on these right, but it was like right. third degree murder or something just him so i do not know what's happening in in that regard i hope everyone is prudent I understand there is this discussion that people shouldn't be looting. There are some people that say, well, it's understandable when you're pushed against the wall. And how do we understand this question? But ultimately, the most bothersome thing today was that man with the umbrella. He looks like the penguin in a Batman movie, you know, or we used to watch this show, The Man from Uncle, and there was this guy with the hat. Who is this guy with the gas mask and the umbrella and the, the hammer? MNS Grease, they say, right, in French. <laughs> uh, 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 how do they call him in French? MNS Grease. And, and what did that mean? It's the, the power behind the power, the power, the mysterious power behind the speaker. Yes, or, you know, even the, you know, you know that I used to study Russian and the uh, early 20th century and the futurists, sometimes they would dress up as bourgeois and go and beat people up. <laughs> you know, to create class consciousness, they, they would say, so I do not know who is behind this, but they have so many surveillance cameras. I trust that they can identify who this person was. They have, I mean... And I am very curious as to how that develops. I mean, you would assume they have, there's the body cam footage that we have not seen. And... <laughs> and and he was like in the background, right? I do not know if you've seen the video of the guy with no, the umbrella. No. I highly recommend you look at it. That's you that's know, a great that, novel. That's a great uh, oh, Coen Brothers movie, The Man with the it, Umbrella. <laughs> the Man with the Umbrella. I remember that other guy. Which one was that show from the 1960s or 70s? That, that guy who was arrested by, by false charges and then he escaped the prisoner or something. And yeah. they were, the man with the wooden leg or something was facing. So... <laughs> But, you know, other than that, uh, there are so many interesting things that are happening in this time, at least in Western Massachusetts. And I am sure that in Chicago and in other parts, there's like a, a renaissance of creativity and with the An federal awakening. government uh-huh, and with the federal government not responding properly, you know, when we don't have enough masks for for our healthcare workers, you know, a simple thing or swabs. There's a lot of new radio that is being produced. There's a lot of creativity. The I jumped to video podcasts video podcast. during the pandemic. Aha. Uh-huh. And like what was happening here in Western, in Massachusetts overall, that early on in the pandemic, like MIMA, the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency, was not even tweeting in Spanish. And now we see that the unemployment uh, web page is in Spanish, in Portuguese, in Chinese, and in other languages. Now we're asking for it to be done in in Cape Verdean Creole. So those have been important yeah. important developments. Yeah. Uh, groups like Radio Plasma or Colectivo de Medios Latinos are producing every day very interesting products. Even Franklin County Chamber of Commerce is producing very interesting things for me to learn how artists, how professors are working on this pandemic and helping out in whatever way we can. Yeah, I mean, it's it's almost, uh, 
I think people are realizing that oh, the system isn't so set in, isn't made of iron, isn't made of steel like we've been told to believe, right? That uh, we you know we we're much more on our own than we realized before, and that's liberating. Yeah. I mean that could that could that could scare you, and I think there was a mass panic because of that. We're on our own, but then after two months, three months, you're like. We're on our own, you know. It's like that that scene in uh, Home Alone two where where Kevin McAllister realizes that his parents went to Florida and he's in New York and he's afraid at first, but then he's like, "My parents are in Florida and I'm in New York," and that's where we're at right now. We're like, we have but power. I would, but I would add something: we're not alone. We are reconnecting because you and I have never been alone, and we've worked together for many years and. You have written so many articles that we've been, you know, we worked. Remember when you did that whole series, how many? 30 days for Latino history. I'm very proud of that. And very few people know about that, about me, that I did that. Um, I, it was... I remember you create, and there was a dialogue too. You wrote all of them, but but we were in dialogue. It was uh, 2015, was um, Hispanic Heritage Month. And I, I took it on myself. I was editor, deputy editor of Latino Rebels. And I took it on myself as a as a lark, but as curiosity, right? Because I don't I didn't really know a lot of the people that I profiled. Uh huh. Um, I did and you a had profile on. Waleen. Yeah, I did a profile on somebody thirty for thirty days, every day. Didn't skip Saturday or Sunday. Yeah. And I had yeah. no life that month, right? Because I would wake up, pick. I had a list, a growing list. People would you would send me somebody that I should look up. People uh -huh. would send me people, and I, I would research. You know, maybe till mid afternoon, and then from mid afternoon, write the thing, which is like 500 words, and I did that for 30 days. And and the beautiful thing that's what, and then we I would remember. talk about what the you know that that day we would discuss on fa Facebook. Oh, this person that, or you should read this that they wrote. And and most of them were not the common knowledge, right? You that know, was the extra we added challenge that I said to myself. Chavez, este, you know, Dolores Huerta, that they are very good and very important. But the effort, you know, was that archival work of finding yeah. all these things. Well, a lot of South American figures that, I, you know, I talked to somebody, it, I recorded a, 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 a podcast with a Colombian pianist, Carolina Calvache, and it didn't, it didn't record. But um, I was telling her that a lot of Central Americans, North Americans, we don't know a lot about South American culture, right? And yeah. that's huge. It's, yeah. You know, when we say Latin America, Colombia, Brazil, that's, you know, you're, you're, you're a professor of Spanish and Portuguese. So you might uh, have something to say about um, the whole idea of adding, including Brazil and Latin America. Some people don't. I do. I, 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 the way I see it, Latin America, the way I see it is that America is becoming a Latin American country. And maybe it always was. Maybe there's no such thing as Latin America. Maybe there's just America. Yes, or the Americas. Or the Americas. Or the Americas. There's a book. I, I do not know if I have it here. No, I took it downstairs. But that I really like that. It's called like the myth of the continents. You know, and what what is this even thing of how we name the places? Yeah. Right? Like, why are like Europe like and Asia, five? right? That whole thing. Yeah, and those first three, right? And and what is Europe? Europe is a peninsula. Yeah. Like if you read really, of Asia, basically. It, see, when I was growing up, we had five continents, right? And those five continents matched a color, right? There was Europe that was white. There was Africa that was black. There was Asia that was yellow. So those were the three. Then was America. Brown. I guess they would give it red. Or red <laughs> I guess or they brown, would give yeah. it red. I do not know. Yeah. But whatever. Uh, Using geography then, to legitimize, legitimize race. And then there was Australia, right? But all these things are arbitrary, right? Yeah. Because how they define continents is a land mass surrounded by the sea. So they're huge islands. Yeah. <laughs> and Europe is just a peninsula. Yeah. And what are the effects of that? So when you make an atlas, like Spain gets its own page, Portugal gets its own page, Italy gets its own page, Greece, and then China gets its own page. And India, that has like thousands of languages and hundreds of religions, and which is a continent, yeah, it gets its own page. So 
we don't even get to learn enough. Like, why do you like Latin America? Sometimes Me? we would call it, aha, uh -huh, it could be Latino America, Nuestra America, America del Sur, Sur America, Indo America, yeah. Yoruba America. Why do we like that term? That was made up by the French. I was going to say during the during the French uh, c conquest of Mexico, right? It was during that period. And they were they they conquered Napoleon wanted to conquer sent his what is it nephew in law or nephew or brother to conquer be yeah. emperor of Mexico and they said oh this is natural because you guys speak Spanish and we speak French we're Latin Latin America we're, we're Latin and and back then Catholic right and right. Southern Europe. Right against Northern Europe at right. a time when the Anglo-Saxons, more with the Protestant tradition, the Slavs were having with the Russians, their things. So the French come up and they say, we represent this Latin race, descendants of Napoleon, of Rome, yeah. you know, and of Catholicism and of this high culture. And there are a lot of Latin American intellectuals who like that tradition, uh, is it incorrect? Is it correct? It's one term we can use. Yeah. And often I, I refer to it. But oftentimes when I think about Latin America, I think about El Sur. Like, for example, I'll ask you a question. Latin America, if we count it as invented by the French, then definitely Haiti should be part of Latin America, and we often include it. Well, you and I maybe, but most I, I know a lot of Latin, Latinos who don't. Uh -huh. Some do, some don't, and then we have the problem in the island of the Dominican Republic, right, that I was shocked when my very progressive students were celebrating the independence of the Dominican Republic from Haiti. Yeah. You know, there are those complications. But oftentimes, some of my friends like you wouldn't doubt to include the Caribbean, Guyana in Latin America, Brazil. Right. But less often we would include Quebec. Right. So to I've what degree that. I've made a I've made an argument in writing about that. Like, you know, mm -hmm. they speak French up there. And when NAFTA was starting, I was in Mexico in the early eighties when they were discussing NAFTA. And I remember like there were Quebecois delegations that would come to speak at UNAM. You know, let's keep the United States and let's keep yeah, that. Yeah. Let's, let's just talk together. So how do you, un and what did Napoleon represent at that time? At that time, Napoleon was modernity. Progress. But Napoleon was going through Europe and overthrowing monarchs and bringing constitutions. And so yeah. It's a complicated question. Yeah, it's very complicated. Um, first of all, I mean, I, I haven't thanked you for coming on the show, but thank you for coming on the show. I mean, we're just getting started, so don't think that I'm, I'm you know, saying goodbye. But um, uh, it's very. I was trying to do my, you know, I do do due diligence on on guests, and it's uh, I couldn't find, you know, so I couldn't find much on your background. I wanted to know how, you know, how do you become a professor of Spanish and, and Portuguese at, at, at University of Massachusetts Amherst? Uh, that that, that interests me, you know, that interests me. You know, I think... How far back do you want to go? <laughs> at, to the beginning, right? Because I think, you know, there's, as a kid, I wanted to be... I did want to be a professor. When I was a kid, I would have my little brother and sister, and I would, we would play classroom. And I would always... I was always a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're a kid, you don't know how somebody becomes a professor. That, that's, that may seem like a naive question, but I, I'm, mm -hmm. there's people who listen to this podcast who really mm -hmm. want to know. I mean, we're... I mean... Let me... Actually, let me just quit these applications because I'm getting messages and bells. <laughs> I do not know. I grew up in Mexico City. And I didn't really know what I was going to study, but I was going to study one typical thing of a middle class Mexican family. Uh, uh, decline. <laughs> uh, um Okay, now I got distracted. Let me, let me. I have you to were going to study something of a. I was going to be middle a middle class. class person. Like, my parents wanted me to be an engineer. What did your parents do? My father was an engineer, industrial engineer. Uh, 
my mother, she had a master's in home economics. They used to call home economics a degree. My mother was a teacher. My father worked sometimes for computer companies, and then he worked for Banco de Mexico for a while. And so then I went to study industrial engineering. But I was interested in the world. I had already started <laughs> listening to classical music. And like my rebellion against disco music back then, now I like it. Yeah, now I like back it too. Then, it was commercial music, and I started listening, look at this, to Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring and jazz. And that was like my rebellion. And I was very cool, and I would go to movies, and I was in the Model UN. And when I went to Tecnológico de Monterrey, you know, many of my classmates were like these nerds. They, they, they were very good in computers, but like Brezhnev died, and they didn't know who Brezhnev was. Not that you had to be like a Sovietologist, but it was an important figure for me. Yeah. So I didn't like that engineer. And, you know, I love math and physics to understand the world, like philosophy. But there they were teaching us, this is how you do a double integral and just repeat. And I love the, the magic of math. Like why by integration you can calculate the volume? Why really, if you put the ball here and you know the acceleration, the ball will fall here. But for engineering, it was very strict. So then I went to economics at a school in Mexico called ITAM. But that school was very much like Chicago style. Mm. Market economy. Like I would ask, where are the unions? Where's international? <laughs> no, no, no. That you're not going to cover. Ah, where are the unions? Uh... And, and I left out of craziness. I came to the United States. My mother is Puerto Rican, so I had a U.S. citizenship. So I just came. I, some friends brought me to the U.S. And back then in Texas, out-of-state tuition was $12 a credit. So, you know, I could come, work at an ice cream store. My parents helped me pay the tuition. And they bought my books. Uh, but with an ice cream store, I was able to go to college and get a degree. What do you think um, about that? That I said on a, a past episode that it, it, it was easier for young people back then to begin a life, make a way. It was possible. It was possible. You can go to, to college like, for cheap. You can make have a minimum, minimum wage job. Minimum wage. And I had advantages. I had advantages that my parents could support me, that I could get into UT and get a scholarship. And back then... I might have even gotten a Pell Grant in a strange situation because my father had a good position in Mexico, but the peso had devalued like 10 times. Yeah. And so for those numbers to pay for that, for these things in the United States, and by getting that little grant, I could pay in-state tuition. Right. So my credits, instead of $12, were $4. Uh, and I started studying Russian language just for the hell of it in the summer. Because <laughs> my boss, who was a Dane living in Texas, a polyglot, like many Danes, like many people in Africa too, or in India, or in Latin America, you know, they know many languages. And he said, I live in Texas. So I would speak to, I would learn one of these two languages, 1984. Spanish, because I live in Texas. That's the year I was born. In 84, Mira, I was scooping ice cream back then uh, <laughs> to make a living, to pay for my school, este, to learn Russian. And he said, or I would learn Russian. I would learn Russian because either we're going to speak with each other or we're going to kill each other. I said, oh. And back then, I liked Stravinsky, I liked Prokofiev, I liked Tchaikovsky, I liked Brahms, I liked Beethoven, I liked Schubert. So I was going to do either German or Russian. Another interesting thing, from my circles in the American school in Mexico, I realized that being bilingual was insufficient. Like here, if you're bilingual, they say you're so cool. You're a polyglot like here, friends, <laughs> if you know two uh -huh, languages. But I had friends who were trilingual or quadrilingual, and right. I was saying, oh my God, being bilingual, English and Spanish, that's not enough. So I took Russian. And I changed from one major to another. I started economics, humanities. I did the same thing. Latin I went to American studies. And at the end, I got a degree in Russian. And I went to comparative literature. I wanted to do political science or history, but I had an F in political economics of Latin America. 
<laughs> and that's hilarious. Texas government. <laughs> I mean, why? I mean, was it? I got an incomplete. I had a professor, Doug Kellner, that I really respected. And the first class, I I got an A. It was like Central American, political economy of Central America. I got an A. Then the next class was a political economy of Latin America. And being a typical sophomore, you know, I thought I understood everything. And I could write in one paper the solution to all the economic problems of Latin America. Oh, man. Have, so that, I got energy an incomplete. Back. have that energy back. I got an incomplete. I never finished it. And I never whined. And it was a good experience to realize that you can get an F and still <laughs> become a professor. <laughs> That's crazy, yeah. And then I had these, I would go to cafes. I love the cafes. That half of my university was there. And I met people from all over the world. And they told me, hey, what do you like? Study comparative literature. You can do Spanish. You can do Russian. <clears throat> I had just married an Iranian and I wanted to learn Persian too. I wanted to learn Uralic Altaic languages, you know, to learn from Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan. But my director told me, no, 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 use the languages, you know, because to learn Uzbek or this, it's going to take you so long and you need to finish your PhD. So I started in comparative literatures because I could look at different things. I was at the University of Texas at Austin at the time. They had a very good cohort of faculty and of students. They were starting this field of ethnic and third world studies, including Irish studies, for example. Texas is this very, the, the, the Texas school system is very good with that, right? Multicultural at studies. Least, Let's at see. least at UT Austin, I was very satisfied. I had very good mentors for Barbara Harlow from the very beginning. Uh, Ramon Saldivar directed my master's thesis, and it was a pleasure to to meet him. We we'll talk about Hegel and his face, and take him to to the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, so there, even if I wasn't specializing in Chicano studies, you know, by meeting students, by joining Mecha, by going to Chicano Night, by having all these activities, uh, I started looking at, at this world. So when I went in the job market, my, my director, Barbara, said, you know, Luis, you have to say, you know, Luis, that I do not like, like uh, I do not write letters of recommendation if you don't ask two weeks in advance. And you haven't asked. So you better get your act together. <laughs> So I applied for a job and the first time it was going to be an experiment. I really wanted to go to Arizona. I was working on the Flores Magons back then. Uh, it would have been nice, but they didn't take me there. I was so naive. And they took me here at UMass. Um, I've been here ever since. But it's so important to be naive. As a, I think that's why whoever makes us gives us that naivete as a, as a youth. Because if you were, if you knew now what, what, if you knew then what you know now, you probably wouldn't have attempted so many things. Correct, 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 correct. And, and finally, you know, I am still looking at, I still look at the world the same way. And maybe now I have learned better ways to deal with it. Yeah. Because I remember very clearly that one of the things in Arizona that I love was they were saying, and we want to develop exchange programs with Latin America and with Mexico. I said, oh my God, this is for me. So then they interview me and I say, yes, yes, we have to find ways for us to give scholarships to people in Chiapas and to people in Oaxaca to come here. Right. But basically the idea now I know was like revenue generation, right? We have to develop programs abroad to send our students and yeah, sell yeah, our programs. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe now some of the things I want to figure out is how to create this program. Sometimes do have revenue generation. Right. Like we're learning in shows like Gentified. And how can you generate, use some of those resources to help specific people? Yeah. Because this is a thing I have learned. Like when we are trained as a professor, they teach us how to be scholars, but they don't teach us how to administer money, how to administer a department. How I to was be just going to say that, like, to you know, developing genius now, you know, you if you, it's not like back in ancient Greece or Rome or the ancient times or Renaissance, let's say now you it's to develop genius or skill. 
you takes lots of money and investment. And so, you know, imagine the people that are in Chiapas, born in Chiapas, who, you know, maybe don't get the 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 uh, opportunity or the, or the exposure to things that don't develop their, their, their genius or in Africa or in Asia. And, and I would move it both ways. I would move it both ways. And really, I do not know if you've been following me on the Facebook, uh, you know, a groups that I have been really putting out there because their beautiful examples are the people of Sarayaco, the Gualinga family. And, and their people who right now in the middle of the pandemic, they have masks, you know, and they have television and they have cameras and they are producing material and documenting. Uh, how much can we learn from them? They have come to our universities once in a while. We, it's not that we have everything to offer to them. Right. What kind of model of agricultural model can the Chiapas people teach us? What can we learn from the millennial agricultural knowledge of the Andes, where you have like terrazas and micro micro environments, uh, things like this? Our, our uh, education, the education system and the media system is terrible at giving us the kind of information that we need and to there make is a better another, world. And there is another thing. You are producing radio right now with a microphone, with these headphones that I didn't need to have the fancy yeah, ones. I yeah. could have done it with my speaker. Right. Uh, but sometimes students are like, what are the $60,000 of tuition that are paying for those private schools? Is it like the penthouse dorms? Is it the beautiful gyms? Is it, is that? part of the university experience or not, perhaps we could use our budgets in different ways and we could credit knowledges in different ways too. And this is a question I have for next semester because I suspect that it will be imprudent to have the universities full of students yeah, I mean, and most... full of teachers. How can we leverage what we know to give credit to students while they're having experiential learning. You've seen how my students were able to translate important documents for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts of COVID. The quarantine documents were translated by undergraduate students who are ready to do professional work. We have students right now in the front lines coming to class in their EMS uniforms. Uh, how can the university give them credit for that? Right. And, and the weird question is, I would love without charging them for the credit, but at the same time, the university needs revenue. Yeah. How can we imagine some of these things. You know, I've been discussing, at least just in text with Marlena, who's so concerned about artists, who are so central today and are performing so nicely for free. How can we create some method that these artists get recognized and get some kind of funding for their work? Is well, it going to be a tip model? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, there's a, there's a, there's a issue that the pandemic's bringing to light, well, most of us knew it, but now it's re very well known, that uh, the system of who gets paid and how, who gets what and how, right? And I do think these EMS uh, students of yours, they should have their tuition, if not, you know, they, they, they're soldiers, right? If this is a war, we're fighting coronavirus, these are soldiers, right? So they should mm -hmm. have, you know, housing, they should have some kind of, you know, it's like a GI bill, but for these these frontline workers, you know, and, and let me and, and let me add something, you know, like discovering the mutual aid organizations that are in place in Massachusetts has been so refreshing. But there is so much still to do. Well, tell us about one of you, them. Tell them. Yeah. Well, just mutual aid Worcester or Lincoln Sudbury mutual aid. And they're all over Massachusetts and what, they might be they in do? other places, too. Each one is different. Yeah. Each one is different, uh, but why, why, why was I mentioning these at this point? Uh, 
how and depending on the network sometimes people are asking for simple things yeah i need 60 dollars to pay for a hotel because my roommate was covid positive okay so then you have the community here giving advice. Yes, maybe I can Venmo you this, or maybe there is this resource. But then some people say, oh my God, if your roommate is COVID positive, you shouldn't be moving into, you should be in isolation. Mm -hmm. So then the discussion is, we see in another group of Boston, I find out that at least in Chelsea, they have made some agreements between Chelsea and Lawrence and Massachusetts General Hospital to use some empty hotels to isolate people. And that is so common sense. Well, look, look, what, ha look what happened in San Francisco, right? As soon as the pandemic hit, the, the, the mayor or, or the governor or something uh, said, we're going to use all these empty hotel rooms and put homeless people in there. OK, you've been talking for years about the homeless problem in California. You had a solution the whole time. Yes, yes. And and in some way, it has to work. Now we're talking a little bit about money. Yeah. In some way, how can we figure out for that hotel to get some money from the government as part of this proposal to use their space to pay for the employees to be cooking? Because if you see how they've been handling it in China, at least one of my friends, Kristen, that you might know her too, that she's returning. She teaches at, a, at an international school in Shanghai. And she came back from Thailand. She had had fever. Mm -hmm. And upon arrival, they separated her from her daughter. They sent the daughter to her apartment and they put her to a facility for like five, six days that they took her temperature. They brought her food. She had a bathroom. And then they took her to her house in a special little car. And for 14 days, she was not allowed to come out, but there were people who would bring the food and drop it off in right. front of her door. Yeah. All these unemployed people could be doing that. Yeah. Or some of us could be doing that thing. Our dorms in the universities are empty. Right. But when I am translating the instructions, the instructions say, stay in a room by yourself and don't share the bathroom with your family. But we're sending them back with those instructions in a setting where five people are living in a two bedroom apartment. So again, why am I mentioning that those mutual aid networks when you are informed about these things that are going on? Sometimes the other resources are very simple. The Children's Museum of Boston is providing this curriculum on a daily basis. Or the how, University what, of Massachusetts. What are they doing exactly? I mean, how? Little activities, little videos of today. We're going to be coloring and learning fractions. I do not know. Yeah. But activities that parents could perhaps use at home. It's almost like uh, it's almost like the Paris Commune in some places where like the people take take ownership of the institutions and use them for their purposes. Correct. 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 And, and again, what I want to insist to is, I do not know exactly early on that I was kind of correcting what you were saying that we're doing it by ourselves. No, what is happening for us, at least for me, having all this time and having to communicate virtually, all these networks that we have developed for more than half a decade, mm -hmm. at least in my case, are coming in place. Right. And again, the experiences. We were together playing with early Latino Rebels radio with a telephone. <laughs> and now you have a camera yeah, and, yeah. and a professional microphone. Right. And originally it was like this. Right. And now you have videos on there. We have to dress up and comb our hair before we could be walking, just not stepping on the on the wood to make too much noise. <laughs> uh, and uh, another beautiful thing that happened in my classes, so many top rate Latino people who came to our classes just to help. 
And to some, we were able to pay, and I am very happy that we were able to do that too. Uh, but Hector Gonzalez Rodriguez was there with El Peso Hero talking to our students and discussing their things. Magdalena Gomez, uh, poet laureate uh, of Springfield, comes and speaks with our students and speaks about them in, our, in her podcast. Luis Argueta, the first Guatemalan director to be nominated for an Academy Award with these beautiful documentaries, she comes. One of our ex-students who... Uh, who is married to an undocumented person and comes to speak about that, that situation and the students listen. And as the students are evaluating the class, they were so happy to realize that even if at the federal level, there is a certain hesitancy or we're not very sure <laughs> as to how they're handling the situation. Right. They were so inspired of so many Latino producers, uh, artists coming and engaging them at this level and having them as role models and as inspirations. Yeah, and I mean, if, I you do could, not, if you could, uh -huh. if you, if you meet, especially as a kid, if you meet somebody who you've been dreaming of becoming, you didn't even know, you, you didn't even know they existed, but you've been dreaming of becoming them. That that inspires you. That, then it's real. Mm. That best person's right here in the room. I want to be that person. You know, Tyson talks about it that he met Muhammad Ali when he was like twelve. But mm. uh, the other thing you're saying is that since we're so tied to the to the economy and market and having to make money every hour, we're either going somewhere or coming back from somewhere that we're we're trying to make money. Now that that is uh, on hiatus, it frees us up for each other. Mm hmm. And, and, and this, you know, we, what, as and writers, what, what, as writers, we tend to like, you know, crap on social media or, or YouTube, but this is, you know, having, you know, spoken to you and, 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 and being kind of in an ongoing dialogue with you for the past few years, it's almost like you have this, and each of us has like a Republic of letters, you know, and it's just not through letters anymore. It's through YouTube it's through P Facebook, Twitter. It's the same thing. We just shit on it because it's new. And and no, and what I am discovering, what I am discovering like these days. Just look, I do not know if it was the Smithsonian or no, no, no. Where is it? Kennedy Center. It's full, full, full of videos of performances that are outstanding, spectacular. Right. And that made me think that I want to retake that stupid slogan and America is great. Yeah. When I am listening to, I am listening because you know how you have the YouTube and one finishes and it continues. <clears throat> right. So I'm listening to this New Orleans Cajun music. And I say, this is so beautiful. Let me see what this is. And then I started looking, and these guys are from Missouri, <laughs> from the Ozarks. Yeah. And then you start listening to them as they are talking, and you say, well, of course, they came down the Mississippi from Quebec to talk about Quebec again. And they went all the way to Louisiana, and you know very well that New Orleans is one of the most important cities of relationships between the United States and Honduras. Right. Where all the bananas uh, the came first, in. And, like... The first printing presses came into Texas from New Orleans. So there is that whole thing. So these guys are pay, playing this music that I identify as, as Cajun, that maybe they would identify as Acadian. And then at some point he says, I'm going to play this song. This song is so old. It's like 200 years before the settling of Europeans in this part of the world. They start singing some weird French medieval song, folk song. I shouldn't have called it weird. You know. <laughs> uh, well, like the song of Roland uh, or something, or what is uh, it? Oh no, no, it was more modern. Not it was like they said, like four hundred years old. So I have no idea. Some folk music. And then as they're talking, they say, this was taught to me by Hector Luis Alamo, the great musician. But that musician, he always told us. Never imitate me. 
keep the tradition, but add something new. Put your personality ah. into the music. And this is what I love to think about traditions and cultures and authenticities and everything else. We can appropriate things like Caliban, yeah. you know, and, right. and, and we can, and yes, why not be part of that Latin America? Why not be part of that Mediterranean, of that lake where north, south, east, west met? Yeah, and I, I fought against not, that, you know, like whenever whenever people say, you know, that's cultural appropriation, it's, no, it's actually cultural appreciation, right? You know, mm-hmm. if you see some, if you see, I mean, I know it sounds ridiculous, but you know, most most people aren't artists. But if they if there's if there if some white person's taking something from Brazil, they like that. Of they course. like that, and when they take it, they add some of their stuff to it, and it makes it new. Of That's what course. jazz is. Jazz is everybody yeah. copying everybody. Yes, and the other day I'm talking with my students because we're seeing these uh, these Nigerian. I don't remember the group. These Nigerian female musicians, like a brass band, playing fellas music. And I tell students, the colonial mentality, I'll tag you later in in that song. And I'm asking the students, what do you think of this? Like, look at it. What? Why am I sharing this with you? And then one student says, all those instruments are not African. Interesting question. There's saxophones, trombones. I said, ah, maybe, maybe, maybe. But for me, all those instruments are central in jazz. And jazz is like central in African diasporic music. So how can we say that these instruments are not African? Yeah. Are we going to say, I do not know who Mr. Saxophone was, but Mr. Saxophone was probably like a French guy who did that instrument for Berlioz to play one day. Are we going to say that no one else gets to use that instrument? And human civilization is poorer if we make those rules, right? If we don't let an African pick up a saxophone. Correct. And that's the transculturacion, right? And that's what we are, a back and forth. And if you ever read Fernando Ortiz's transculturacion, what I love is how he's talking about how tobacco and sugar affected Europe. And, and again, like you read Caso. An indigenista in Mexico, and he says, oh, the Indian culture is only the one that isn't contaminated by European. So what do you mean? So to be an Indian, you have to be frozen in 1492. Right. But the Europeans, they can pierce their noses. They can wear dreadlocks. They can smoke ganja. They can drink coffee. They can have China with tea. Yeah. That Those are all British. different. That's... Tat, you know, tattoos, that's South Asian, tea, Chinese, mm-hmm. sugar, mm-hmm. Caribbean. So the Europeans, in some way, they can, as the center, they can absorb everything and take it as their own. But then if Richard Rodriguez wants to speak in English, they say, oh, no, 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 you have to speak in Spanish. Which oh, that's such I'm, a good, that's I'm such a good point, Richard though. Rodriguez, no, that is such a good point, though, right? I mean, there's, there's the people who try to preserve the culture, right? Whatever culture they're coming from, right? But that's that's ultimately a conservative and actually a wrong-headed way to go, right? Because human beings, we are evolving. Our culture has to evolve. Yes, yes. Uh huh. That's. I know. I know. I'm, I, I, you and I understand this, right? But estamos in love, you know. You know what I mean? <laughs> but like you know, when people say "Make America Great Again." I say make America greater. It's great. Let's not go back to what it was. Yes, we can look back and that was great. That was great. That was bad. Let's move forward. And and we are part of that America. Yes. This is Nuestra America. Yes. This is Nuestra America. And actually, Nuestra America was written in New York. Yeah. The, the, uh, the Puerto Rican flag was sewn in New York. Mm-hmm. And, and, that, and that is another question, too. That is another question, too. To what degree, at some point, I'm thinking, is it my time to go back? Like, what would happen if all these doctors, engineers, unionized electricians, plumbers, would go back to Puerto Rico? Right, right. Uh, exactly. What, and I think, I think that's what we're buy, supposed to be doing. And buy cheap real estate right now that right. the vulture funds are buying it. 
Right. Not that we all have money to buy the real the, the real estate, but I bet you it's much cheaper to buy it right now in Puerto Rico than to buy it in Massachusetts. Right. So, you know, I'm exaggerating, but another thing that we discover, and this is complicated to discuss, Central America is not the household that we paint it to be. There are problems in Central America, but they are very creative people in, in El Salvador, in Honduras, in Guatemala, surviving. In rich countries, uh, natural making, resources. Making fisheries, selling cheeses, playing music, teaching each other. But That's what Cuba teaches you, right? That's, look what Cuba is able to do with, a, with an embargo. And, and again, Cuba is Cuba with a government right, doing right, things. Right, 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 right. A lot of these initiatives are grassroots. Right. And the problem is, the problem is that the only way for a Central American to get a legal visa to come to the United States right now without waiting for 10 years is to claim asylum. And in order to play, claim asylum, you have to say that your life is so horrible that you cannot return. And maybe and you'll get asylum. Are, and there are many people with very legitimate concerns. For sure. I think that there are very many other people that are forced into this situation for a variety of reasons. And how would it be beautiful if we could, all these essential workers who are so productive, we say, you know what, we want to go back and build our country. It's strange what I am saying. No, I mean, I think, especially Latin American immigration, it's, it, maybe it's different than uh, other kinds of immigration, but I think it's always the same. I, I always say nobody wants to leave their home. Your home is beautiful. You, you leave because you have to, right? You have to, you have to get food. And so, I, I, you know, I know people in most, I think most immigrants, the dream is to go to America, make your money, and come back home. And then be treated. And, you know, if they could treat us like regular humans, like they treat the Europeans. Yeah. That if you're married to a European, your in-laws can come and visit you without even a visa. And many of them never want to come to live here because they do not like the healthcare system. They do right, not like right. the food. They do not there's like no culture all these here. If you're European, so, there's no culture. I know, here. and there's culture. No, that thing that there's no culture, that BS. There's a lot of culture here. What, well, I'm, I, I know, what is these that I know but I'm saying like, if there's a lot of Europeans who say there's no culture here, right? Ah, but they haven't gone to see Little Joe. They haven't danced. <laughs> they haven't. They, they, they right, do not right. know Bad Bunny. You know. Uh, I say it's so the greatest many. culture, right? Because it's a it's a mix of all cultures. It's a meeting place of all cultures. Yes, yes, and and what is culture? Like my students say, oh, I'm quite American. I have no culture. Like what is culture for you? The exotic. If it's right, the exotic, right. when I first came, you New Englanders, you get these insects like that they call lobsters, and you throw them in a hole in the ground with stones and wrap them with algae and put corn, and and you call it a clam bake. That is very exotic for me. Yeah. Or you guys, like on the week before St. Patrick, you all drink green beer and get drunk and go and hang out in the streets. That's very exotic for me. Right. <laughs> uh, right. Baseball. Uh, and the everyday. And again, the other day I was in a restaurant. And they tell me, what kind of food would you like? And I say, this, this, this. And I say, this is American. I say, what's American? Right. Like in my town, American is breakfast burritos. It's sushi. It's pad thai. It's gyro sandwiches. It's falafel. That's American food for me. So when that was the topic of my class of Latinx literature, what is that tension between wanting to affirm our own uniqueness and belonging? Right. That assimilation that perhaps we should frame it in a different way what's this transculturation because yes i have to accept that i live in the united states that my children are american and 
that in many things I'm used to this work. But that, and that's what, in a very basic sense, is what we're trying to work towards, right? A culture where, a, a way of thinking where you meet somebody and they're different and that's good, that's okay, that's interesting to you. Oh, that per Joe is so unique and Mary is so unique and Jose and Maria, they're all unique. They don't have to be like me. I don't have to be like them. Correct. Correct. And that's what I like of Residente's last album. That he has musicians from all over the world and Chinese music and North African music. And mm -hmm, that's, that for me is the big question. And we are at a threshold. Yeah. And we could really screw this up or we could come out in a very nice world. I am concerned. I am concerned. Everything's up so in the air, people, right? I'm concerned about the president agitating. I am concerned seeing people parading with weapons. Because there's I people who don't agree with you, what you and I are, have been saying this past, you know, 50 minutes. They don't the think, well, they think that white, you know, the races need to stay separate. Culture needs to stay the way it is. America needs to be go back to what it was in the 50s. I mean, they that's what then they think everything that has happened is is bad. I mean, they, and this, we're talking about that millions is, of people, tens of millions of people. That is, for me, one very complicated question that I would like to understand better. What? I understand why many of the people in the Midwest, in the, the, what we call the Rust Belt, yeah. are resentful of what we call the coastal elites. I do, too. I have a feeling that many of us look at them with disdain. I have a feeling, my understanding, I cannot follow up with a lot of evidence. But I have a feeling that the last campaign, the last presidential campaign early on in the Midwest, both Trump and Bernie were appealing to the same kind of candidates. Candidates who have lost their jobs, candidates who have been victims of the deindustrialization, candidates that really, I think, that certain wing of the Democratic Party, beginning with the Clintons, you know, that wing is very much modernized. And, you know, your industrial work is that you have to get a green color and you have to come to college and do a work in an office. And being a plumber or an electrician is not necessarily the answer for you, but plumber and master electricians, you can never take their jobs away. There has been the destruction of the unions. Uh, and then, you know, the immigrants are racialized and there is that, that, that continuation too. But I think that that has been weaponized by Trump, that racial resentment. But you know, do you know what I mean? The opioid epidemic uh, is affecting these people and their jobs are going. And it's complicated and it's very easy for me here to condemn the miners who have for five, six generations worked as miners. Uh, I do not know if I'm making sense. No, 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 I you're right. I mean, and, and, and the way they see it, you know, coal mining is, is is part of the reason why America is the wealthy nation that it is today. You know, those 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 generations, you know, mining coal might be on its way out, but it was once, you know, mm -hmm. the backbone of industry. But um, and there are union jobs and union jobs. And that's but that's very old, right? That they did that in the South, right? There was there was always poor white people in the South. And you know when they started getting mad and upset, the 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 rich the rich plantation owners would go, "Don't get mad at me. You need to get mad at those dark people over there. They're the ones Correct. you're in competition with." Correct. But see, the nuance I want to add is that throughout, and I am meeting more and more, there are many good white people in Appalachia. Oh yeah. There are many and. And oftentimes, I feel that the way the discourse is used right now, they label them all as these ignorant whites. 
racist. Maybe I am wrong, but that is where I would like us to have more nuance and more discussion. And anybody, and anybody, you know, listening and watching should really look. And you probably remember this in the late '60s. There was a group that came out of Chicago called, I think, the Rainbow Something. And what it was is that in Uptown, North Side of Chicago, poor neighborhood, was the white Appalachian youth. They're from West Virginia, those places. And then the Puerto Ricans in Humboldt Park, and then the black people on the South all got together, said, "You know what? We're all different colors, but we're all dealing with the same issues." How do I pay my bills? How do I get health care? How do I pay the rent? How, how do I get the cops stop beating on me? Mm-hmm. And uh, right, there, there are people in Appalachia who don't buy into that racism stuff, mm-hmm. who mm-hmm. really wanted to vote for Bernie. And that, you saw that in Illinois, too, where Hillary in the D- Democratic primary in 2016, Hillary won all the rich places, but Bernie carried all the rural counties, all the poor places. Yes, and and. I do not know how much more time we have, how much, because this leads me to another question that is just fun. Your Cubs cap. <laughs> that I was, and, and, and this has a lot to do with Latin America too, because the other day they invite me to a class, a beautiful class that I like, nutrition and culture, culture and nutrition. And they say, now Professor Marentes is coming here to speak to you about how they eat in Latin America. And I say, thank you for inviting me and I am honored to be here. But all I can tell you is how I ate in my house in Mexico with a Puerto Rican mother in a middle class family. Why was your mom? That's interesting to me. Your mom was Puerto Rican in Mexico City. That's, you know, you barely hear about Puerto Rican diaspora in Mexico. Oh, there's a big one. There's a big one. So that's how I could eat. And Mexico in itself has 50, 100 different cuisines. I bet you that even in Honduras, like in the coast, it's different than different in the Caribbean. Coast. Yeah. And the the so, so there is there is all this variety always. Um, um, Check this out. In my in my uh in Logan Square, now it's very gentrified, but when I grew up there it was mostly Puerto Ricans. I went back there last year, and I went to the fruteria that I've been going to since I was a kid. My grandma's taking me since I was a kid. Now it's got windows. Before it didn't have windows. Um, it would just have plastic. But now it's real fancy. And I went there, and there was some kind of tour of white people in the neighborhood. And there was a lady, and they were doing a tour of the fruteria and picking up, like, mangos and papaya and saying, this is a papaya. They eat this with this and this. This is a platano, a platano maduro. They eat, They fry it. And I'm like, what are you? And you, and you, have you seen, heard the song of Willy Chirino, Mr. Don't Touch the Banana? Banana belongs to Chango. <laughs> <laughs> I got to check that out. Yeah, yeah. but it's, it's, it's crazy. Like, um, and, it, and that's what they look at in Gentify. That there is one scene when they come with the boss and the wise Latina says, okay, I put my feathers for a little while and then, you know, we go and party. <laughs> yeah. How, how how are you going to do that? And again, I go back to Chicago. Like, if we talk about Latin America so big, there are certain stereotypes about Chicago. But from the little I know of baseball, like the Cubs are for the one percent, and the White Sox are for the rich Yeah, you know. But, but I do in- not know if it is true. What is the history yeah, behind um, it? If it's the neighborhoods. Well, Wrigley but was one of the baseball, founding fathers of Wrigley is one of the founding fathers of uh, of of uh, Chicago. You know, he helped built it in the early 1900s. And yeah, it's in it's in the middle of Lincoln Park, which is very rich. You know, Mayor Rahm lived there or lives there still. Um, in the South Side, Chicago, black and brown, right? But the thing that breaks down with Latinos is that since Humble Park is on the north side. And that's where all the Puerto Ricans live in Mex- and, uh, Mexico. I was going to call it Mexico. Pilsen and Little Village, La Villita, are on the south side. You, you find almost as a rule that Puerto Ricans are Cubs fans and Mexicans are Sox fans. Ah, oh, my. Because, see, because you're the, you're the privilege with the U.S. citizenship. See, so you're the one person. Right? <laughs> no, and, that's, and that is almost by design, right? You know, there's a great story of uh, – uh, I forget. You probably know the professor. Or the, she just wrote it, uh, Brown in the Windy City. 
came out like a couple years ago. She talks about the Latino political history of Chicago. Oh. And, you know, Puerto Ricans and, and Mexicans used to be in the same neighborhood once with black people. And then urban renewal exploded that. And every, you know, the three races, let's say, the, the, obviously there's no such thing as race, but let's just say Puerto Ricans and Mexicans and, and uh, blacks, they were all spread to the three corners of Chicago, uh, north, west, and south. And so, Boricuas, it, so Boricuas cheer for the Cubs. Right. Even when O.C. was the manager of the White Sox. Right. Right. Even when O.C. was the manager of the White Sox, yeah, they always, had these Latino managers. They still yeah. prefer the Cubs. For sure. And that's and we had, uh, what's his name, uh, on, on, on the Cubs from, from Puerto Rico. We, we always have really good Puerto Rican players on the Cubs. Uh, mm-hmm. I remember when the Sox won, I didn't even care. I did not even care. <laughs> I like him because of O.C. You know, I like him so much. Uh, but uh, so... You know, we're we're past the hour. I want to thank you for coming on. Um, All right. Let let people know where they can find you. All right, where they can find me. I do not know where they can find (laughs) you. you Just don't give us your address. (laughs) You know, I used to be tweeting a lot at Marente's Luis, but I haven't been tweeting. I should go back and then. No, I don't do it either. You know, I was. It's a. It's for a certain kind of discussions, right? There's current certain kind of conversations happen on Twitter that I don't, I'm not interested in having. Yeah. I'm now learning Instagram and learning these things, but you know, we've been working there with you, Mass, and imagining maybe having a little podcast one of these days or something. So just keep your eyes open and we're imagining, I'm trying to imagine what to do this summer and next semester. Yeah. I mean, what classes. are they telling you about, you know, doing virtual? I know California state system just went virtual. They're, they're... We don't know yet. We don't know yet. I am happy that we're unionized and our union and our university, I think, given the constraints, has behaved well. Uh, the University of Massachusetts Amherst with some issues, but it's been OK. I they're going to make the announcement later. I don't envy the people who have to make those decisions. But I understand that I will have support of, of my supervisors if I determine that I am too worried to teach in the classroom. Mm-hmm. They will allow me to teach online. And I have a feeling that unless we have the tests and the possibility to do isolation and quarantine in the universities, at least in some of them, it would be irresponsible to open them. Right. So some schools, like I was speaking with a friend who is in a smaller liberal arts rural campus. There, maybe if they have a few less students, it might be possible to house them and to teach with a lot of land. Right. But where I teach, and I cannot imagine BU or NYU, where I teach, we have towers, you know, 15, 20 stories where... And part of the university life is that partying and going Mixing in with people. homes and drinking from the same cups and sharing food. <laughs> so I think for many kids, it might be better to try to find internships. To and a lot of kids are, home, right? They're, they're taking yes, a semester off or whatever. Yes. So let's see how it's going to be. It's when tough for open, students. It's tough for, imagine college was hard enough. Imagine being in, during a pandemic. So what do you want students to be thinking? How, how should they be thinking about this situation? And, and what do you think? Yeah, you've seen so much. You've, you've traveled, you've read, you've, again, you've, you know, what do you think about this moment? I don't know. I don't know. For the students, I would say find a mentor. You must have a mentor. Speak with a so faculty yeah. or someone you know. Speak seriously about what you're doing next semester. Don't wait. Uh, plan. That would be. What was the other question? What I see? I do not know. I am sometimes optimistic. I see that at the grassroots, at the individual level, there are a lot of possibilities. I am also worried. You and I have read Fanon, The Wretched of the Earth. And one of the lines that I remember early on is suddenly someone hit the trigger. And I live in Concord. I live next to the old North Bridge. 
about which Emerson wrote the shot that was heard around the world. And what happened that day? According to the British government, some thugs right. were accumulating barrels of gunpowder mm-hmm. and cannons in a farm. Right. And they were in the they, they sent the came, British out there to get it. They came to do their obligation of protecting the colony from these thugs from from Concord who were arming themselves. They faced each other across a bridge. And someone shot. Baldwin has an essay on Harlem. I think he wrote it in the, in fifty eight or fifty nine, and he just describes it. It's a powder keg, and so mm-hmm. if something, if there's going to be a riot in Harlem, don't be surprised. You know that's what happens with powder kegs. <laughs> they and explode. That umbre- and that umbrella man is the one who worries <laughs> me the most. Yeah. And again, I trust. That these government that we have that has ca- and you know those cities, there must be cameras everywhere. Right. If they could find out that that other guy wasn't beat up by the white guys, remember that that actor who said that he was beaten up. Jesse Smollett, in yeah, Chicago. in Chicago, yeah. If they could solve that mystery, I trust. I hope Chicago sends those very special investigators to Minnesota. And helps them solve this problem. But they only solve and mysteries that they want to solve. Uh, but they have the capacity to solve it. Oh, for sure. And in Chicago, they're very well trained. So maybe you should write to your mayor and say, please, let's go and help Minneapolis send those experts to find who these people Well, I'm in Vegas now. I've been living in Vegas for three years, so we I got know, our own problems it's here. <laughs> it's funny, but you say as a former, I still think of you as a Chicago guy until you have a Las Vegas baseball team. But they should be able to find out. Really, who is this? Who are these agitators? Are these the Antifa guys? Or is this something more sinister? Yeah, I don't know how to feel about Antifa people. You know, there's, I think with any group, there's people in it that are messing it up for everybody. But I mean, I'm not for violence. But when people, oppressed people use violence, I'm not exactly against that either. And again, they should be very careful. Right. That guy who broke the windows was doing it on purpose. And I I do not want to be one of those who's condemning or right. celebrating. Right. I am just It's about meth- methodology. We point, know we agree what needs to happen, all, but we're arguing about the methods, right? And at this point, all sides need to be prudent. Yeah. But let's see what happens. Pero well, seguimos en contacto. Yeah, we'll we'll end it we, there, did, man. we didn't even talk about it. No se lo tragó la tierra. That's I know. But we'll, I'll bring you back on uh, at least again in the summer. But you hold up and uh, we'll be in touch, okay? Okay. And then tell me when this comes out so I know. Oh, it'll probably be out. The, the, the podcast will be out today, an audio version, and it'll be on YouTube in the morning. Perfect. Sounds good, man. Take Stay care, happy, healthy. Sir. Take care. Uh-huh. Don't get into too much trouble and don't gamble now too much. Now I'm not a gambler, but I'll try to stay out of trouble. <laughs> Take it easy. Take care.